Okay, now, first thing we want to discuss is for your second um, grade, which will complete the first 50%, the paper is 25% of your grade here, and I'm going to give you a take-home examination. These are your three questions, which will be 25% of the grade, and the final 50% will be the final examination. Okay, so now, what you have here, we have three questions. You're going to choose from one of these questions. First one is to critically analyze and evaluate the Arab conquest of Egypt and Nubian resistance. Second question, critically analyze and evaluate the French invasion of Algeria and the Algerian resistance. And the third question is to critically analyze and evaluate the Sudanese efforts to Islamize southern Sudan and the SPLM resistant from 1956 to 2005. Now, when we talk about critically analyzing something, what we are literally saying is that you are to break down specific details in order to show the relationship of those details to the whole subject that you're talking about. So when you're analyzing, you're actually getting into the meat into the heart of the subject matter that you're discussing. So if you choose to discuss the French invasion of Algeria and the Algerian resistance to that invasion, which culminated in the, um, the independence of Algeria, then you will get into the details of the French invasion. The why. Why did the French invade Algeria? What was the purpose behind their invasion? For what reason were they there? And so you're going to come across a, a great deal of information that discusses that. For example, with this question, if you want to, once you begin to look at the second part of it, which says, and the Algerian resistance, then you'll get into the works of the, the Senegalese, I mean the um, Martinique uh, psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Frantz Fanon. He has one work, uh, The Wretched of the Earth, which was actually translated into Kiswahili uh, in the 1960s. Well, you could, as far as looking at the Algerian resistance and the aspects of the Algerian resistance, you would use Dr. Frantz Fanon's work. As far as looking at the purpose behind the French invasion, you would look at French historians, their perspective. You would look at Algerian historians. You would look at continental African historians who have written about this subject matter as an example. So you would critically analyze it. You would break it into details. And you're also asked to evaluate. So as you're analyzing, you're, you're making an evaluation of the, the French purpose. You're making an evaluation of the Algerian resistance. So you're not simply telling us what happened, but you are giving us your thoughts your perspective on what happened. And so you will choose one of these questions and you will answer it and that will serve as your take-home examination. Are there any questions so far about what you're being asked to do? Okay, so now, now, when I talk about critically analyzing and to continue with the subject that we started on Tuesday, that's exactly what's going on. I'm giving you a critical analysis as an example of Kart Hadash or Carthage. As you read in the material, you saw Carthage. I'm giving you a critical analysis and an evaluation of Kart Hadash. I'm not simply telling you information about what occurred in the 600 years of war that Kart Hadash waged with Greece and Rome. But I'm also giving you an evaluation of that. I'm giving you my perspective. Because in history, when you are reading anything that someone has written, you're getting someone's perspective. Historians may, they don't always do this, but they may agree on what they are considering to be the facts at a given point in time based upon their experiences, based upon archaeological evidence, 
based upon a scholarly consensus, whatever the case may be, they are giving you their perspective. So, as you wrote your papers on Kush, as you wrote your papers on ancient Egypt, as you wrote your papers, those of you who wrote about Akhenaten, those who wrote about Hatshepsut, you were reading the perspectives, the point of view of certain scholars. And when I had you to then go beyond that, lessons learned, lessons that we could draw from it, now you are interjecting yourself into the subject matter. You're putting yourself into it. So you're not simply telling us this happened, you're evaluating it, you're passing judgment. To evaluate is to, pray, to appraise, to pass judgment. If you wanted to, you know, people appraise houses. So you're making a judgment on the quality of that house. The characteristics of the house, you're passing judgment on when you appraise a house, as an example. So you, in history, we make an appraisal. When we start to, talking about the lessons that we can learn, we're making an appraisal. We're evaluating. We're judging. We're, so we're no longer passively reading. We are now placing ourselves. To interject yourself into something, to project yourself into it, is to place yourself into what you're reading. If you ever bother to read novels, say if you read Nguji Wathiongo, the le uh, his latest, uh, one of his novels that I just finished was The Wizard and the Crow. And well, when you read a novel, one of the skills of the good writers is to get you to place yourself into the story. If you read Armas, uh, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born, as you read it, because it is set within an African city, and it deals with African issue. Armar is dealing with corruption in government. And the problems faced by a person who's attempting to do right. Well, as an excellent author, he causes you to place yourself into the position of the characters. Whether it's the lead characters or the supporting characters within the book. So as historians, as a person who's reading his history, as a person who is drawing lessons from history, you are now placing yourself into the position of the persons who you're reading about, who you're studying. Then you've engaged in historical analysis. As teachers, when you're teaching history, your goal is to get your student to place themselves into that position. What would they do if they were the ones facing that situation? Do you understand what I'm attempting to say? That's what you're doing in history. Then you're drawing lessons from it. So you're not merely memorizing facts. Yes, when you read history, there are dates, there are years. But when you start to drawing those lessons, placing yourself into that position, how would you, what would you have done had you been Walimu in 1967? What would you had, have done if you were in Kappa, 2000, I mean in 1995, between 1995 and 2005? Would you have followed the same course of action that these two men followed in their course in the policies they implemented for the country? Or would you have done something differently? See, then when you're reading that history, you're putting yourself into it. So, on Tuesday, we talked about Kart Hadash. And I told you, as an example of drawing a lesson from history, when we go and we look at the history of Kart Hadash over that 600-year period, they were constantly engaged in a defensive war. The first war they fought was with the Greeks, the Greek city-states. This war was fought between 650 and 275 BCE. So you're talking about the 400-year war nearly. 400 years of warfare. Uh, the entire period, you know, you're talking 400 years. You're talking four centuries. You're talking what? On average, what, 16 generations, roughly. Think about it. You're talking about a warfare that, if you were alive in 650, began when you were alive and ended 16 generations, roughly, from you. You know, to give it some, some, give you an idea. If you figure that the average person is living to be 70 years, 
In the West, the average person lives to be 70 years, on average. If you're in the East, in Japan, the average person lives to be about 84. Here in parts of Africa, people are living about 100, 103, 104. But think about that. That your entire lifetime, your country, you know, a friend of mine, someone that they know just, just passed, and that person was 103. They died a couple of days ago. And so imagine that for that person's entire lifetime, their country was at war. And then you figure that we're talking in the case of Greece and Carthadas, you're talking about four centuries of warfare. Here is an independent African country, and for four centuries this engaged in warfare with the country out of Bulaya, which has a specific purpose of doing one thing and one thing only, destroying their country. And so that's what we're looking at here when we talk about Carthadas. Those of you who wrote papers on Carthadas, the most of the materials you looked at specifically focused in on the Punic Wars, what the Romans called the Punic Wars, which was the wars between Rome and Carthadas, which began in roughly to what, 276 or so? I mean, not 276. The Roman Carthadas Wars began, it began about 12 years later, like 264 or something in that, some t somewhere along in that period. So Carthadas had continuous warfare throughout its entire existence. That's one thing we, that's one thing we must be aware of when we talk about this civilization. When we talk about this African kingdom, this African civilization, when we talk about these Watu Weusi, we're talking about a people whose entire existence as an independent nation, they were engaged in war. The entire existence. That's something we have to keep in mind. And we talked about the fact that they had a commercial empire, they were a trading empire. A commercial empire, a trading empire. They were not an empire that was based on tribute. Keep this in mind. Most of the time when we read about empires that have been established, you have some form of tribute that's involved, enslavement that's involved. Carthadash was a trading empire. Trading empire. It maintained political control over its col colonies. Its colonies amounted to city-states that were planted all around what is now called the Mediterranean Sea. During that time, that same sea was called the Comedic Sea. It was named after an African country. This entire, what you now call the Mediterranean during the time of Carthadash was not called the Mediterranean Sea. Just as what we now call the Atlantic Ocean during the time of Carthadash wasn't called the Atlantic Ocean. That was called the Ethiopic Ocean when you look at this period in history. So you're talking about an African kingdom, Carthadash, which was a trading empire. It was not based upon its, well, it was not an empire that was based on subordinate kingdoms paying tribute. You know, where, you know, every year they sent so much gold, so many enslaved peoples, so many other resources to the heartland of the empire. No, it was a trading empire. Keep that in mind. A trading empire. A commercial empire. Right now, when you look at the world and you see world trade, and you're talking about foreign direct investment, and you're looking at international business, international political economy. All of these things begin with these Africans, first in Canaan, and later the African civilization that took over in Carthadash. What you see now begins and is given and is controlled for, several, for close to two centuries, two, three centuries, I mean two to three millennia rather, by Carthadash by this civilization. So it was a trading empire. Its wealth came from investing in international trade, from being the premier international trader. So that's another lesson we can learn. Not merely just quoting facts about famous peoples, but that's another lesson we can draw from these people. Is that they built an empire based on trade and not one based on conquest. They did have to engage in warfare because the colonies that had been established by the Cushite Canaanites had been independent 
they had maintained political independence. And Canaan, the, the shippers in Tyre and Sidon in Canaan simply received a percentage, you know, a commission from facilitating the trade. But those kingdoms maintain, I mean, those colonies maintain an independent political existence. They maintain taxes within their, re, I mean, within that, the city state and the surrounding agricultural region because the cities were fed by the villages through agriculture. And so they survived off of, they utilized that agriculture and passed, maintained taxes along those villages, but they also engaged in trade with the interior of the areas wherever they were, the independent kingdoms that were there. So they had maintained an independent political existence, and then when in Kart Hadash, in what is now today Tunisia, when they, in 650, 638, between 650 BCE and 638 BCE, when they um, asserted their independence from Tyre and Sidon and Canaan, then they also, in an effort to deal with Greek encroachment, because remember I told you the other day, the Greeks began to encroach on the Carthaginian sphere of influence beginning in 750 BCE. 750 is when the Greeks began to colonize in the areas where Carthaginian had established colonies. Whereas Carthaginian established um, colonies that were engaged in a reciprocal relationship with the peoples in the area, so they were mainly trading ports, the Greeks came in in conquest, taking over the lands, reducing the peoples in those areas, for example, Sicily, reducing those people to enslavement. And then trying to muscle its way into the sphere of trade and international commerce. So that's the difference between the way those these two peoples went about doing trade. All right, so in 638 BC, Carthaginian had attained political and economic independence from Tyre and Sidon, and it moved to protect its commercial interests and check Greek expansion by establishing a more tightly controlled, politically centralized commercial empire. So that's what they do at that point. But there is a problem in the center of the political and economic organization of Carthaginian. There is a problem. Now, they accomplished this tax by appointing governors and a bureaucracy peopled by public administrators accountable to the government in Carthaginian over its colonial possessions and the expansion of its armed forces. The problem with this policy of improvement of the armed forces was its use of foreign mercenaries in its military as this introduced a divisive element into the heart of its empire. That is key because the downfall of Kart Hadash centers on how it chose to militarily defend itself. Do not fool yourself. You cannot be some nation and decide you're going to be a peaceful nation and not maintain a military. You can maintain a military, I mean a peaceful policy. Uh, in the kingdom of um, the kingdom of the Bakuba, which is still located in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in their history, there's a king, Shama Balongo. And King Shama Balongo maintained a policy of nonviolence in his international dealings. But he also maintained a standing army. So his policy of nonviolence was one that we are not interested in conquering other people's territories or none of these things. We want to engage in peaceful coexistence. But he understood that everyone else may not accept that policy. So he maintained a standing army. And when his, if his diplomats were insulted in any way, he sent the standing army out to deal with whoever had offended them. So it was always a, uh, a, uh, a, a punitive, the expeditions were always punitive in defense of his individuals. So don't fool yourself into thinking that you can build a commercial empire and not maintain a military aspect. You must have a military to defend it. The world shows you that today. It was African military weakness that allowed a great deal of the colonial conquest to occur. And the African military weakness centered in 
this unity. Something key we must learn. Another one of those lessons you learn from lit history. Coming back to Kar Hadash, the problem with their policy was how they chose to defend the empire. Through the use of mercenaries. Now, if you think about their mindset, they have a commercial mindset. They're thinking supply and demand. They're thinking in what is the most, uh, what is the most effective and efficient economic way to defend the empire. So, they maintain a strong navy, but generally they would people that navy and people its, uh, it's, it's marine, at the, the military aspect, it's marine force with mercenaries. And a mercenary, a merc, is a person who is there for the money. They're being paid. All right. The Kart Hadash oligarchs had, a, had national identity with the Kart Hadash nation. Whereas the mercenaries had allegiance to the highest bidder for their service. Even so, the Canaanites of Kart Hadash established a socio political and economic structure replete with socio political and socio economic processes, protected by a formidable military machine which established socio-economic and socio-political interaction between colony and mother country that supported Karthadash-centered power dynamics and ensured Karthadash of socio-political and socio-economic control over its colonies and spheres of influence. But keep in mind, in 650 BCE, Karthadash was employing mercenaries. As it continues its existence, its reliance on mercenaries increases. A question was asked the other day about the Roman purpose. To skip ahead a few hundred years, the Roman purpose, why they began to interject themselves into the problems occurring within the Carthage Empire. One of the reasons they began to do it was because the Romans had analyzed the Kart Hadash military position. At this time in Roman history, the Roman army is peopled by the Roman aristocracy. In order to be a part of the Roman army, you had to own land. What was the ration? What is the reasoning behind this? If you own land, you're going to fight to protect that land. The Romans didn't allow poor people to fight in the military at this time. They weren't allowed. So at this particular time in Roman history, you have in the, the Roman military, which is primarily a ground force, an army, is peopled by people who have national identity with the Roman state, the Roman Republic. They have national identity. They see themselves as Roman. Now, what do I, when I say national identity, what are we talking about here? Okay, in Tanzania, you have some people in Tanzania who are Tanzanian and have national identity. You have other people who are Tanzanian who have citizenship. That's totally different. You can have an Iranian who's been here since the 1960s and who is a citizen, but they don't have Tanzanian identity. You don't believe me? Listen to the conversation when they're talking. Some people will identify as Tanzanian and the nation. Some people will have been in this country, I've witnessed it myself, will have been here 50, 60 years and will say, you know Tanzanians are. And I'm like, don't you have citizenship here? So they have citizenship, but they don't have national identity. In Kart Hadash, with their military, some persons in the military had national identity with the Kart Hadash Empire. But other persons had citizenship. You know, you can have citizenship bestowed upon you. Look at the Roman Empire. Um, by the time, by the period that the stories in the Bible are supposed to have occurred, the Romans conferred citizenship upon non-Romans. So, and this was a great, a great esteemed privilege. This was something that was considered wonderful. So if you look in the New Testament in the Bible, you see that Paul 
though he was Jewish, was a Roman citizen. He had Roman citizenship. But notice, he did not identify himself as a Roman. He didn't have national Roman identity. His identity was to the Judean state. His identity was to the temple. His identity was with his people. Notice that. So you can find all these examples across. But you can look right here in Tanzania and see that. Now, the Romans at this time had national identity with the Roman state. The Greeks at this time, Greek city-states. But the Greek military was primarily peopled by mercenaries. The, the Greeks had a mercenary military. They had a barbarian military. They were there for the pay. They were in the military and they went out in conquest because that's how they got paid. Why does a thief, why is a thief willing to risk death in order to steal? Because of the remuneration. Because of the reward. What they feel they can get out of it. Same thing with the mercenary army. All right, so, now, once Karhadash established dominion over the vast majority of the independent colonies of the Canaanites of Tyre and Sidon, Greek expansion was halted in 580 BCE. 580 BCE is the first clash between Karhadash and the Greeks at the Battle of Lilibaeum. All right, the Karhadash defeated the Greeks temporarily halted Greek incursions into Karthadash territories and spheres of influence for nearly a century. Nearly a century. It's only about 80 years. It, for 80, it, halts, it, it halts major Greek expansion for about 80 years. But it doesn't end it. The Greeks attempted again to colonize Karthadash national territory in, 30, I mean in 509 BCE with a military thrust into the heart of the Karthadash Empire in Africa. See, there's another lesson that we can draw from this. Because if I'm fighting somebody for four centuries, if my total existence, I mean, time dealing with the people, I'm fighting them uh, for over four centuries roughly, you should learn some lessons about the psychology of the people you're fighting. We don't do that. Look at the way we wage Af warfare according to African law and how Europeans and Arabs and other Asians wage warfare according to their own law. There's a difference. We have the humanity not to wipe out people. So we, according to African law, according to traditional African law when we wage warfare, we don't wipe out the entire people all the time. In general, there's a, you know, there's, a, there's a sense of humanity which allows, you know, it writes all kind of laws into, you know, for uh, when the people you're dealing with warfare. But not the peoples we engage. The Greeks, the Romans, did not operate according to that type of a law. Because, you see, in the beginning of the warfare, this period of warfare between Greece and Karthadash, Karthadash has the military advantage. It has the commercial, it has the financial, and it has the military and the political advantage. It's a unified empire, and it's dealing with Greek city-states. It has the military advantage. But there is something in the African identity which allows us to show uh, humanity towards our enemies. And what we see as we look at the Karthadash, the history of Karthadash, is that the Greeks and then the Romans took advantage of this aspect of African humanity. All right, so, all right, now, in 509, the Greeks invade, they, sent, they, they, they invade to what is today Tunisia. They invade the heart of Karthadash. All right, this attempt by the Greeks was soundly defeated by the armed forces of Karthadash in 511 BCE after a protracted three-year struggle. Took three years, but they defeated them. Now, a question was asked the other day about how, you know, you, a question you really want to ask here, which is what was asked about the Romans, how were the Greeks able to invade into the heart of the Karthadash Empire? Because Karthadash had established political hegemony. 
Hence, there were people who were surrounding Karthadash who were a part of the empire, but who didn't want to be. They had been conquered. They had been forced in. Before, there was a reciprocal trade relationship when the Kushite Canaanites controlled it. But when Karthadash steps in, they establish political and military hegemony. The word hegemony, control, domination. People don't like being dominated. So, which means, you may defeat me at first, but the moment somebody shows up who's your enemy, I'm willing to work with them. Because I hope to get my freedom. So that's what allows the Greeks to be able to do this in the heart of the Carthage Empire. And it also allows the Romans. The question, the person who asked the question about the Romans had read to the end. So he could see at the final war, the, the Third Punic War, he could see that the Romans were able to, the Romans had uh, commandeered the Numidians. They had co-opted the Numidians, an African kingdom, who had been forced into the Carthage Empire, but were always looking for a way to get out. And this worked to the Roman advantage because the, Numidian, the Numidians was the cavalry arm of the Karthadash military. The, Kar the Roman military had issues standing up to the Karthadash military because of its cavalry and because of the fact that Karthadash utilized a resource that was located in Africa that the Romans didn't have. Elephants. Karthadash trained elephants for combat. All right, so anyway, that's how you're able to do that. Uh, that's how a lesson, that's a lesson you learn. You know, so if you decide to write about the Algerian situation, how were the French able to come in, in there in the first place? Well, if we look at the history of North Africa, we can kind of get an idea. You've had wave, you had had wave after wave of conqueror. But the, the natural people who were there, whose land it actually belonged to, were still there. This, those people had been fighting. They had fought the Romans when the Romans came. Everyone that was there didn't. Uh, first off, let's back up. They fought Carthadash when the Carthaginians arrived. They fought them. They fought the Canaanites. And constantly fought them in various skirmishes that could flare up into large major military engagements. Those same people turned around, fought the Romans when the Romans showed up. On, I mean the Greeks. Then they turned around and fought the Romans when the Romans showed up on the scene. Then they turned around and they fought the uh, <coughs> they fought the Vandals when the Vandals came up when, in their conquest of the Western Roman Empire. Those same persons then fought the Byzantine Empire that was based in what was then Constantinople, but it's today Istanbul. Those same people then turned around and fought the Arabs when the Arabs came through. Those same people then turned around and fought the Turks when the Turks came through and conquered the area. So when the French showed up on the scene, those same people fought them too. So the, the French were initially able to come in and undermine Turkish authority in the area by aligning themselves with peoples who had been conquered. Because a people who've been conquered in, our, in an empire, you got some people who are there by choice. It's a confederation. Most African empires begin as confederations. Groups of people get together and confederate themselves, decide how they're going to uh, elect the leader and whatnot, and they form the heart of what becomes the empire. But other peoples are not so willing to join, so they have to be conquered. Look at uh, South African history with the Zulu. Uh, prior to the Zulu hegemony, the, uh, I'm forgetting the name, uh, uh, Dingizweo, uh, Dingizweo, who is over the, uh, and I'm forgetting the people's name right off the top of my head right now, but Dingizweo, who becomes a mentor of sorts to Shaka Zulu, Dingizweo is, a uh, the way he was building his empire was through, you know, it was a confederation, then he would try to co-op people. You know, get them to come in peacefully. They would only go to warfare with the people if they refused to join the empire. 
Now, when Shaka, once Venus Williams assassinated, Shaka comes and the Zulus gain the uh, supreme position within the empire, Shaka employed a different methodology for expanding the empire. But you can see this, you can see the African process at its heart join us peacefully. But then if the people refuse, conquest, it would be a force to join through conquest. <clears throat> so anyway, any empire is always going to be the seeds of its destruction. So if you look at uh, the different areas where even though most of the global south consider themselves independent, it's a political independence, how can you have so many of these conflagrations that rise up? It's because of the fact that it's still a part of the an economic component in the economic empire of the West, and lots of people in the country see this carefully. So, another lesson you can learn. Because when you look at Northern Africa, in the period of the Algerian period, when you look at, if you choose to do the period with the Sudanese, these are the things you're going to see as you start to researching to answer these questions. All right, now, all right, now, when Kart Hadash defeated the Greeks between 509 and 511 in the war, they didn't follow up the war in a way that would have ended the Greek threat. All right, so, which means, because at this time, Kart Hadash has the military upper hand. But rather than uh, follow it up with a military assault into Greece, Greece to end the problem once and for all, which was a possibility given the superiority of uh, the Carthaginian superiority, which brings to mind an African proverb that when a bull gets his leg broken, he is sure to go back to his yard. Now, what is this proverb telling us? That if I'm fighting you and I injure you, you're going to go back to do what? Rest, recuperate, heal. Then you will return. So if you really want to make sure that that bull doesn't come back, you have to kill the bull. Now this is an African proverb. It's well known across the continent. And it is in our proverbs that we, we can find traditional African law. So you can see that Kart Hadash didn't operate according to that proverb. So they defeated the Greeks and left it at that. Now this particular problem is one that is a recurring issue in African history. Put more succinctly, it is a failure to comprehend the Makasudio of a people and the relationship of those intentions to the Utamaduni of that people. When you're dealing with another people different from you, they have different intentions because they're operating from, different, from a different cultural perspective. We will be operating from African cultural perspective with the persons we're fighting against whether you're fighting for economic independence from the Europeans or you're fighting to prevent economic subordination to the Chinese and other Asians, those people are operating from a different Utamadun, a different cultural perspective. They have different sets of values. In Europe, they talk about the brotherhood of man and all of these things. But as Fanon tells you, everywhere you look, they leave bloodshed. In China, they don't even have that type of a history of the brotherhood of mankind. The East Asians are the most some of the most chauvinistic peoples in the world. By chauvinistic, they maintain a superior position for their culture, for their peoples. So they may act as your friend now, but given the political, military, and economic might, they're going to treat you worse than the Europeans. So we have to keep in mind that when we're dealing with other people, a lesson that you draw from history. A lesson that can be drawn from the history of Carter Dodge being used as a case statement. You have to make sure you master the culture of the person you're dealing with. I can engage peacefully in trade with you, but I had better study your culture. I know my culture. I know my values. I must study yours because I have to be able to consider what you are capable of doing. Kart Hadash, in his dealings with first the Greeks and then in his dealings with the Romans, did not consider what the people were capable of. In the initial interaction, 
Kardashian had the superior position. Even if you have the superior position in a relationship, you must still learn the mentality of the person you're dealing with to know what they are capable of doing given the chance. See, that's uh, in statistics we call that forecasting. You must see into the future. In traditional African science, we call that predicting, Forte you know, fortune telling, seeing into the future, you're predicting the future. When you forecast, that is quant utilizing quantitative methods to predict what could happen. You have to do that when dealing with people. This is a lesson you learn from history. Because remember now, history does not exist out there. History exists in here. History exists in the mind. And so when you're drawing lessons, you have to project these things into the future. All right, now, so, uh, a problem resulting from a failure to properly take note of the teachings of the Wahanga and of what one should be cognizant of as a result of one's experiences with a given people. So you have to that's another lesson we can draw. What are these people capable of? Yes, today they may be fighting with you, but given the opportunity, what are they capable of doing? Do they have the capability of doing you harm given the opportunity? And you must always err on the side of saying yes, because you want to protect yourself so that these people cannot do this to you if they're given the opportunity to do this to you. A lesson to be drawn from history. All right, so now, in a short digression, some of you looked at ancient Egyptian history. So you went back and you wrote some excellent, some nice papers on that history and the lessons you could learn from that history. So here's one particular lesson that the people of Kart Hadash could have learned from a neighboring kingdom that was in existence during the time of Kart Hadash. And that would be from the uh, ancient Egyptians, the people of Kemet, and their interactions with the peoples of the deserts, the so-called Semites, peoples of the Arabian desert area. All right. Now, in a short digression, let us consider the so-called Semites and their overwhelming of the Canaanite heartland in what is contemporary Palestine. As a result of the fact that Canaan was throughout much of its history a part of the imperial dominion of first ancient Egypt, or Kemet, of African Kush, and the Canaanite ruling clans as represented by the Mphalmate, Mkewe, Mphalmate, temple priestesses and priests, council of elders, had to have been aware of the pointed words of Mhenga Keti to Mhenga Mkerare Pera of the of uh, ancient uh, ancient Egypt. So he left these words. So uh, Mkerare became the Pharaoh. His father left some words, some teachings for him about his dealings with certain peoples. And so Keti informs all who care to listen about the necessity of listening to the Mababu. He says, consider the Mababu as an archetype of the ideal and emulate them in thought and deed for what we create is brought forth from right knowledge. He says, look and meditate on how their words are engraved in stone and are everlasting. Open your eyes so that you may study their words and reproduce their acts. For the master had once the need of a guide. Then he tells them specifically about a key people who were a threat to the empire. And he says, with regards to the sand dwellers, they referred to the peoples of the Arabian deserts as sand dwellers because they lived in the desert. He says, his environment is inhospitable, short of water and trees. The roads pass through rocky terrain and are difficult to travel. The sand dweller doesn't have a permanent home. He traverses the desert by foot in constant search for the necessities of life which there is a dearth of in the desert. <clears throat> Since his beginnings, he has been belligerent towards all men. 
He is never victorious in war. However, he has never been overpowered. He does not follow tradition and make war in the season of war. Instead, he attacks as a thief. Do not concern yourself with him, for the sand dweller is like a crocodile on the banks of the Nile. A single person he will attack, but he will not raid a large city. So if you listen to these words about dealing with the Arabians, what they're saying is that uh, we can conclude that the cultural ecology of the desert dwellers is conflict-based, with clashes occurring over scarce necessary resources, most importantly such as water. This type of an antagonistic human environment interaction breeds a tradition in the sand dwellers where life is believed to be harsh, unforgiving, uncompromising, in struggle, in which one must naturally war and take what one needs regardless as to consequences. Life is seen as a reality where the taking of a human life murder is equated as being no different from the taking of the life of a lower animal, killing. In fact, prowess in warring upon and murdering, subjugating and raping humans is, in this worldview, looked upon with a sense of divine admiration. One brags as to the number of lives taken. Since life is considered difficult and spirituality is, in a sense, the deification of a culture's view of life, then, in the view of the sand dweller, the creator is a, a god of war. Harsh, difficult, unforgiving, uncompromising, a warrior. In short, a god of deprivation. As women are the means by which life is expressed, and in this human environment interaction, strength is respected as a means of making one's way in the world. Read conquest. Everything and everyone must be conquered, and life is harsh and must be subdued. Then so too must women, thus women are, dis are degraded. This type of attitude is handed down through the culture to succeeding generations. People interact with the culture that they're brought up in. That culture pays a part in shaping the uh, cognitive culture of that person, the affective culture of that person, the psychomotor aspect of that person, and the spirituality of those people. Uh, it shapes them through that culture. So you have to keep that in mind. So if you're dealing with a people coming from that type of a background, their culture is going to be different from someone who grows up in a, in a land of plenty, in a land where the, the necessary resources of life are plentiful. You're going to produce two different types of culture. All right. Uh, Dr. Sheikh Antajo of Senegal told us as much with his theory, uh, his, his theory of culture centering with the, uh, uh, the, the differences between the European and the Asian cultures and African cultures and why the European cultures breed people who are, have so many different phobias and the African culture breeds a xenophilic, a culture of acceptance, <coughs> a culture of love. All right, so now, Amos Wilson told us that all human life in many obvious and subtle ways reflects the influences of the prenatal existence, and the prenatal existence in turn reflects the wholesome or unwholesome nature of the maternal prenatal intrauterine environment. Her mental and physical life history, which includes that of her ancestors, and her prenatal and physical lifestyle and attitudes while carrying her child. So, this is how the culture is passed. The experiences of the culture. You just had a study completed over the past two weeks that shows that memories are passed down from mother to child through the DNA. So, the environment that the mother who's carrying a child is in is shape playing a serious part in shaping the child. And so this is how these things are passed down through the culture. So you can pass these things down through generation through generation. So had Kart Hadash bothered to read and pay attention to what the peoples of Kemet had said about the dwellers, the Arabians and whatnot, and had also later written about the Greeks, they would have known how to properly deal with these peoples. 
But that knowledge was not passed down. So that's another lesson you can learn is by going back and seeing what did your ancestors have to say about the people you're interacting with. See, when you learn what a people such as the people of Kratadash didn't do, then that tells you something that you should learn to do in your interactions with peoples today. Because history is about learning lessons. And that's something we have to keep in mind. All right. Kart Hadash should have known through their trade relationships the, the, the culture of the Greeks. They should have been aware of what that culture was like. And if they had studied their culture, they would have known. You can just see it in Greek mythology. It's a psychopathic homosexual culture demonstrating the characteristics of the neurotic psychopath. Such as having no conscience or moral values due to an arrested development of the spiritual cognitive and effective faculties. The spirituality is degenerate. The mentality is, is underdeveloped. Their emotions are underdeveloped because they suppress emotion. To be emotional is considered weak. So they suppress an entire component of being human. Psycho which directly leads you to psychopathic behavior. Another characteristic is an extreme failure to show accountability for personal decisions and actions of which all Greek tyrants, including the egocentric Alexander of Maston, is a fine example. All right, Alexander of Maston, you'll read him in the history as Alexander the so-called Great. He impulsively murdered the son of his top general, and then he killed the general so that the general wouldn't find out about what he'd done. Throughout all of his other horrid actions, he never once engaged in critical self-reflection. The psychopath pursues limited short-term goals. <coughs> Again, you have Alexander of Mason, where he engaged in conquest, but to no purpose. He was conquering because that was all he knew. He only knew warfare. He had been brought up in a warfare, in a war-based culture. Before the Greek city-states were united, and then went out to conquer other peoples, they fought amongst themselves continuously throughout the history. All right, so anyway, so now, uh, this is a lesson that Kart Hadash failed to draw. So throughout his wars against the Greeks, what Kart Hadash would do was it would defeat the Greeks. Throughout those four centuries, they continuously defeated the Greeks in war. Continuously. Only on occasion that they happen to lose an engagement. But they never followed it up by completely destroying the Greek threat. Didn't follow it up. And as a matter of fact, the third uh, Greek Carthage War led to the rise of Rome. Because when Carthage fights um, with the Greeks in the third Greek War, this is now when the Greeks had perfected the uh, method of warfare utilized by Alexander Mason. That became the preeminent method of warfare in the world. <clears throat> well, because um, Carthage had been involved in warfare with the Greeks and had been utilizing various treaties with the Romans that were never really adhered to by either one, each one was just... Um, intended to step in to take advantage of the position of the other should the other lose. Well, by the, having fought all of these wars with, against the Greeks, and then with Rome rising, because the third Greek Carthage War uh, is where we get the term Pyrrhic victory, the general of the uh, Greeks, the Greeks actually won all of the major engagements fought between the Greeks and the Romans. Carthage, for the most part, was on the sidelines in the third war. It steps in, in the end, when the Greeks attempt to invade into Carthage territories. The Greeks win most of the engagements, but it's a Pyrrhic victory. The Greeks, each time they win, they lose massive amounts of troops and material. So at the end of the war, the Greeks are eventually defeated by the Romans, but now Carthage is in a weakened state, the Romans are in a superior state. The Romans follow this up by the, uh, in the first, second, and finally the third war against Carthage. The Romans win the first war against Carthage and reduce Carthage to vassal status. 
Kahladash becomes a tribut, tributary to Rome. This then leads to the uh, advent of Hannibal, one of the greatest African military generals of all time. And Hannibal invades the, the Roman heartland, <clears throat> but he doesn't, he's unable to press his victory through laying siege and conquering Rome because of the mercenary nature of the Carthaginian military. And I told you that was a problem in the beginning. Because the, the Carthaginian oligarchs felt that, you know, the war was pretty much over, so they wouldn't finance siege equipment, more another navy and whatnot. And so this gives the Romans time to rebuild his forces and lead an assault on the Carthaginian heartland. Hannibal has to be recalled to Rome. By this time, his forces are bled dry. The Numidians have defected from Carthage to the Romans. And so he now, he, Hannibal, is going to war with a citizen army that's not part battle hard. They lose. Carthage is further reduced to <clears throat> in tributary, a, a, a vassalage. And then, uh, Finally, the Romans come up with a pretense to start the Third War. They invade, and they not only destroy the city, but they burn it to the ground. And that was the Roman entire intention, because for the past, prior, that the past 50, almost 100 years, uh, one of the Roman senators had begun and ended his speeches with, no matter what he was talking about, he said, and Carthage must be destroyed. You know, if he greeted someone, greetings, fellow Roman, Carthage must be destroyed. Because the Romans understood that that was their nemesis. They had to destroy this empire. Because remember, a bull with a broken leg only goes back to its, it will go back to its yard to heal. So he knew Carthage was a threat. So anyway, there are lessons you can learn. Each time Carthage fought in the war against the Romans, the Greeks and then the Romans, when they had the upper hand, they did not follow it up decisively. That's a problem. <clears throat> All right, so anyway, that's just a short overview of the subject that we're dealing with here. And that's an idea where we talk about pulling out some of the details, analyzing them, and then, you know, making evaluations. Evaluations. And that's what you're going to do here with this exam. And you'll turn that in next Thursday. Are there any questions? Then I will see you next Tuesday. <coughs> oh, one person per question. Yes. Hmm? How many people are going to work with me one question? Uh, this is individual. Yes. Yes, individual.